Oh, I just want a functioning country. I want LRT not to break down. I want uh, to be able to go out when it's raining and not fear that I will not be able to make it back safely. Yeah. I just want speed in, in government agencies. So over the next few days leading up to the 15th general elections, I'll be sitting down with some GE15 candidates to ask them important, important questions. I want to get to know all their thoughts on the issues that affect so many of us. Let's see what they have to say. So um, I'm sure you saw the, the news clip, the reason very misguided, extremely racist news clip from a TV station yeah. encouraging Malay voters to get out there and vote if they don't want political power to fall into the hands of Malaysians of other races. Semua pengundi Melayu perlu keluar menunaikan tanggungjawab masing-masing jika tidak mahu kuasa politik dikuasai kaum lain sekiranya Pakatan Harapan atau PH menang. I'm so sick and tired of people encouraging Malaysians to go out there and vote based on race. Yeah. Right? But at the same time, I think we're aware that some Malaysians can can be swayed by racial rhetorics very easily, right? So how do you think we can cleanse this really honestly just disgusting behaviour, like Clorox said, out of Malaysians, like this very divisive mentality out of Malaysians? Structurally, I think, it takes a lot of political will to ensure that political parties based on race mm. cannot be established, cannot be cannot thrive in Malaysia. That is your starting point. Because for as long as you have race-based political parties, they exist. Every year, they have their AGM and they have their grassroots. For those leaders to win internally, they have to make very uh, sensitive speeches for them to be seen as a hero, to be able to protect. So this will never end. And that's why, as long as you allow these kind of race-based parties to be set up and to grow, right? All these speeches will be repeated every single AGM. Every time campaign yeah. comes, they will start. And that's why we need to support multiracial parties, yes. and ensure that race-based parties die a natural de death. We need to do that. Um, the other thing is to also educate in school. There must be education in all the schools that, you know, the colour of your skin and the colour of my skin have no difference when it comes to our rights mm. in voting, right? And your my card and my my card carries the same value. Yeah. Our my cards are yeah. of the same value. And so because of that, um, TV stations like that, I, I definitely wish one day we can have a racial a harmony act so that we can make sure speeches like that people who provide content like that you know face action yes yeah. definitely growing up listening to these very racially charged speeches that i think clearly hasn't done us any good yeah right the fact that we're talking about it like six, more than 60 years later it's a problem so people keep telling me right hey nandini malaysia not ready for a female or non-Malay Prime Minister, like, you need to wait, give it another 50 years. But right, I'm thinking, I'm sitting here and thinking, the same could have been said for America when Barack Obama became President, or New Zealand when Jacinda Ardern became the Prime Minister. She wasn't the first female, but she was the youngest world leader, right? So, and no disrespect here, right? I'm not talking about reserve elections like they have in Singapore or anything. I'm just genuinely curious about the willingness to consider a candidate regardless of their gender or race. When do you think Malaysia will be ready for true diversity? I think after 2018, after the, the fact that Malaysians voted out a government that was 60 years old, anything is possible already. Because the, at the, the, the acceleration and the speed of how we move from one party system to two-party system, 2018, changing three prime ministers and having three major coalition contesting in this 15 January election. That tells you that in a short span of time, Malaysians can turn things around. So we must believe, uh, really, I think, anything can happen anytime. It is up to the leaders to step up. It is also up to 
the, the voters and the political leaders around them to say we are open to anything. Yeah. I, I think that it's just a matter of time uh, and the right moment, the right group of people making that decision, I think things can happen. I love that. I, I am I'm very excited uh, one day to be able to see, you know, not, not just a, a female Prime Minister or a non-Muslim uh, or non-Malay Prime Minister, you know, what about the possibility of an East Malaysian? Yeah, I was just getting there. East Malaysian? Yeah. Orang Asli Prime Minister? Yes. Why not? I mean, we're looking at female, we're looking at, you know, gender, we're looking at uh, uh, race, we're looking at uh, region that they represent yeah. and age, you know, what about a young Prime Minister? Correct. This year, the political participation um, of uh, female candidates is particularly yep. low, right? 13.5% out of, I think, 1,836 candidates, despite us making up almost half of the population. Yep. So maybe can you share with us what are some of the gender challenges that female politicians face in this country or people who are you know, females who aspire to be in politics to make a change out there and how can we increase female political participation? I think the first step is the entry point. When you join a political party, your participation, how active you are, really depend on how much time you can spend working on politics. And so a lot of young mothers are already naturally filtered out, naturally excluded, simply because they just think that I just cannot afford the time. Yeah. There's a lot of price to pay and especially more if you are married and your spouse is not supportive. Your spouse does not want to be involved in politics. Mm. You can have very good um, candidate, but what, I, what if the husband is in a business that is working with the government? So there's so many things that family wise people will make their decision to just filter out sit out then you have once they join right they have to serve and and after serving you have then have to win election within your branch within your state committee yeah after after that that kind of campaigning going to states going different places to get work is also about time yeah and then when you are then talking about being offered a seat the seat that is immediately next to your house may not be available. Yeah. They might say, okay, a seat that is available for you is up north mm. or down south. Now, you will be thinking, even if I take it and if I win it, how am I going to juggle serving my children and at the same time going there, responding to an emergency in my constituency? Yeah. So you are looking at needs, demand, request, availability of those seats. And because of that, you you just don't get the desired outcome that you want. I feel like when we talk about feminism or advancing women or putting you know making sure that there are there are female representatives for us everywhere wherever we go, um, I think we also forget that it's impossible to do it without the help from the other gender. Yeah. Or just in people in general, whichever yeah. gender, whatever gender, just it can't just be women or female presenting people who are like, hey help us, yeah. hey make us, you know, but like exactly like you said. You have to have the support of your whole community yeah. in order for you to Correct. spend that time and do it. But yeah. we are saying that you know we just need to make sure the level playing field, there's a level playing field, that entry level is fair. Yeah, of course. Yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, I, I would like to stress that I agree with you, that when we talk about representation, when we talk about race and sexuality and gender and everything, yes, we want fair representation, but it also has to mean that these people are credible. Yep. So, of course, we're, yes. we're both in agreement yes. on that, 100%. Yes. Yep. Okay, so I feel like there are two groups of people, right? Um, and Three, but like I think I want to focus on these two. One is, I feel like, um, people who are Malaysians, who are very privileged, and um, they don't want to vote because they know that when things get really, really bad in Malaysia, right? I can leave. I'm privileged, you know? Also, even if, let's say, things get really, really bad, I will sit in my, you know, like, in my really gorgeous, like, rose, you know, rose-tinted cocoon, and I will be perfectly fine, right? Nothing affects me. I am, you know, I, I, I'm not a marginalized community. I'll be fine, right? And then there is, of course, that group of people mostly from the marginalized communities who are truly disheartened, let down by the system and just feeling very disappointed, extremely jaded. But when you talk to them, you can see that they have all the rights to feel that way because they have been let down repeatedly. What is your message to the first group of people and then the second group of people? 
for the first group of people who feel that as long as I have money, I live comfortably, I don't have to worry about you know, what happens out there, I don't have to participate in the political process. Uh, I think the, the MCO lockdown has shown to you that even if you have money, if there are policies uh, that are being made by politicians affecting you, you can have money but you cannot fly out of the country. You can have money but you cannot buy eggs. You can have money but you cannot leave your house. You can have money, but you cannot have Wi-Fi. You know, one day, all these things can happen to you. Uh, and as a result of that, there is a need to ensure that the people who make decisions on your behalf best represent you and have your interests at heart. That's what voting is all about. It is about you choosing a representative to go to parliament and in the event all these things happen, you are comforted and you know that this person whom you have voted for will vote based on what you want. Yeah. It comes down to that. You remember there will be there will come a time when you have money and yet you cannot leave the country. Yeah. Lockdown has shown to you. Yeah. Yeah. No chicken, what are you gonna do then? Yeah. Fishes are fishes are going away. Food security, yeah. Yeah, food security, yeah. climate change. We're not talking about that. Yeah. Yes. So the second group of voters belong to those who are disillusioned. Uh, my message to them is very simple. Now, the fact you sit out an election, even if you don't go out, there is a decision being made by you in the ballot box. When you sit out an election, when you don't put your vote in, somebody will still come out as a winner. Yeah. The act of you not going to vote will also determine the outcome of the winner. So it's not just about you proactively going to put an X you decide a winner. The fact that you don't go out, there will be a winner. And that winner, whom will be making decisions on your behalf, may not be what you want, mm. right? That's why it's very important that we know Malaysians are very resilient. They are very resilient people, you know. During the lockdown, when the government failed, they have a Kita Jaga Kita movement. They, they came around. And I will say that, you know, um, from 2018 to now, I've seen so many different voters, they are disillusioned, but again, I still see them now at Chirama, they are back. They are back, they are out again. Uh, and so, this is uh, really about life lesson, you know. It doesn't matter how much, how many times you fall down, how many times you uh, hit a setback, you, you get back up and you run again. Because if we give up, the other side will win. And we cannot afford that for the, I mean, there are other Malaysians who cannot fly, leave, cannot leave Malaysia, who, you know, every single meal is dependent on the policy that the government makes. These are the people we need to fight for. And because of that, we, we just can't give up. So I appeal to those who feel like their votes don't matter, you know. I'm here to tell you that your votes actually matter. If you don't go out, the other person will automatically become a winner. I hope that my stage is loud and clear to everybody who it's like, I don't want to vote lah. Even if you do not have to leave the state. You know, some of us are spending thousands of ringgit, especially our friends who have to go back to East Malaysia, yeah. spend day, they, a thousand may be nothing to some people, but a thousand is everything to a lot of Malaysians, yes. especially after the two years we've had. But even then, people are doing whatever they can to go back and just, just for that, probably take like, what, five minutes je, yeah. right? The time that, that you spend just putting that pangka, but people are going and doing that anyway. So the rest of us who are privileged enough to, to go to our voting centres yeah. and vote, we should yeah. do that because if it's not for us, it's... We just said that, you know, at the end of the day, everything will affect you. I think I've also said this a lot of times and I think a lot of politicians always stress on that. But at the end of the day, if you really tak kisah pasal yourself ka apa, at least do it for the ones you love. Yeah. Because if you don't do it, it's just not going to look great. There are, there are people who are not given voting rights in Malaysia. And because they are not voters, yeah. their rights are, are neglected. Children cannot vote. 17, 16 years old cannot vote. Uh, foreign workers serving, building LRT, working in your house, they cannot vote. That's why their welfare very neglected. Animals in Malaysia cannot vote. Yeah. The tigers, the elephants are all becoming extinct. But those of us who can vote, we, our vote can actually impact these categories of people who cannot vote. Uh, and therefore, because of that, we have a duty to actually exercise that on their behalf. Malaysian mothers fighting for citizenship yes. for their kids. When you go out, it's not just thinking about what, what this politician can do for you, what this party that you vote for can do for you. It's also about what they can do for those who don't have a voice. Yes. We so, be selfless. Yeah. Go and vote. Yeah. Try. Or at least try. It's literally one thing. We're not asking for anything. Just go and vote.
Yes. Pelajar bukan pengantin. Child yes. marriages are unfortunately still a thing in Malaysia, deeply rooted in poverty, customs and inequality. How can we reduce and eventually, um, of course, end child marriages? But in the meantime, what can we do to protect our children? We have done the roadmap uh, to eradicate child marriage in Malaysia within five years. Uh, and, you know, that was launched in 2020, January. Uh, you have about 60 programs uh, by agencies in federal and state to work together to eliminate uh, teenage pregnancy. I think there's a lot of awareness campaign that must be done. A lot of people think child marriage is really about a five-year-old girl marrying a 50-year-old man. No, it is about children below 18 getting married. And this can involve teenage sweethearts. Uh, simply because they just don't know how to protect themselves. Uh, mm -hmm. So all this require religious parties uh, and politicians, civil society, parents coming together to solve this. Yeah. Do you think all politicians should be legally mandated to declare their assets for greater transparency? Definitely. I think declaration of asset um, should be done after they win power. From mm -hmm. the moment they win an election, mm -hmm. they win power. When they hold executive power or even as opposition, you declare for the term that you are elected in. Yeah. Right? To see whether you gain anything out of extraordinary sources mm -hmm. and processes uh, during this time when you were elected. Yeah. Yeah. So because of that, I also think that who you declare assets to very important. Uh, if you declare it to just your prime minister, no point, right? Yeah. You must declare to the right person. Just the act of declaration doesn't yeah. mean anything. And after you declare, there should be some checking lah by MACC, yeah, right? You know, they can choose not to declare under their name. They can hide those things under their kid's name or their, their spouse's yeah. name. So there must be checking. Pontik sekolah tiga kali, yeah. selalunya dapat um, get warning, right? Sepuluh kali boleh kena suspend buang sekolah. Do you think there should be punishment for MPs who berturut-turut don't show up for parliamentary sessions? Uh, definitely, because uh, our duty is actually to enter parliament and, and to yeah. do it. But um, yeah, I think speaker, speaker can look at the standing orders and legislate on this. Um, unfortunately, uh, some of the party leaders themselves um, are, you know, mm. kaki ponting. Yes. So when you do that, you cannot expect the, their party members to actually take action on their own That's party right. leaders. But there's a lot more people talking about attendance now simply because people are now counting and yeah. disclosing that. Those days, you know, nobody talks about it. Yeah. Nobody is interested. But digitalization has changed everything. When Parliament Malaysia is like, you know, um, they, they do the live sessions, right? Yeah. So we can see it, right? What I'll do is just let it run just to see who's saying what. Yeah. Just so that you can remember, right, when the day comes, <laughs> you want to remember this person said this one thing. And if you don't agree with it, yeah. so easy, right, for you to make your decision. Yeah. So please watch the sessions. Yeah. Monitor them. So some sort of you do think there should be some sort of policy or anything like a law in place so that there's greater accountability yeah for sure that's why i think it starts with political education a lot of times when people are electing a politician they say oh i don't see you in kopitiam but my duty once elected is not to spend time in kopitiam but is to spend time in parliament there are politicians who spend all their time in Kopitiam but they are absent from parliament. There's no point. Yeah. So that's why the political education is important. What are the criteria yes. that you are looking for in a good parliamentarian? It's not taught in school. And at the no. same time, we expect 18-year-old, once they leave mm. uh, Form 5, SPM, they somehow must get this right. Yeah. Yeah. But 50-year-old voters don't know yeah. about this. Yeah. We're still discussing, I think even before elections were announced when there was disaster source, there were still, people were still confused about, eh, how come state elections, like my state, you know, like, do I need to vote? Like, people yeah. still don't know that sort of, the fact that there is a difference between state, state and, and federal that, power. That, that there are two papers if yeah. your state is going for elections, right? Yeah. We, to some of us, maybe we think it's basic, but the fact is, it's not, and I think it's fair to say that it's not, because yeah. we're not teaching kids these yeah. things. We're not teaching kids the important things. As much as, you know, maths and science and chemistry and physics and, Economics and everything else is important. Political participation, I guess, and political education is definitely right up there. Yeah. Because it will de literally determine whether how your life is shaped. Yeah. So, yes. Um, should the B40 community get free tertiary education and how feasible is that for a country like Malaysia? 
I haven't done the the test uh, on the on the budget, but I definitely think that uh, B forty communities need to be supported more. Not just three hundred allowance every month, or not just a bag of rice. Yeah, there must be meaningful support given to them yep. from transport to education. Yes, uh, and giving education, I think, is easy, but giving quality education is the challenge. There's no point giving them an education that they cannot do anything with. You know, we have a lot of random courses that we provide, but people cannot come out and get jobs. Yeah. So, so it's important to look at even if we are giving it free, what kind of courses that will empower them. Yeah. True, and just sort of employ employability, right? Like teaching, teaching students or young people, like how do you write a cover letter? Yeah. Like how do you, you know, those kind of basic yeah. stuff. One thing I'm really passionate about is vocational training. I really mm. feel that we are not utilizing the gift in 50% of our population. Now we assume that everybody, 100% of the kids who enroll in form, Standard 1 or Form 1, they are good in studies, but not that's not the case. There are other children with different gifts. They may be good with carpentry work. They may be good with you know fixing cars or handphones or sewing uh, or design and arts. You know, the fact that our how we value and assess their capabilities based on how well they do writing the answers on paper. Yeah. That shows you that the people who are assessing this, we are getting it wrong. Mm -hmm. Imagine if we really tap into that 50% of the population who are gifted, not in studies, you know, but we provide them a platform to, to, to be successful. You know, imagine at from, from one, at 13 years old, you can actually specialize. If you don't like science, biology, maths, you know, you can specialize in, um, you know, creating content in which you are good at. I think we'll be we'll be really you know birthing so many talented yeah. Malaysians everywhere. I'm I'm actually very thankful that Masli, in his time as minister, yeah. he removed exams for the younger kids. Yeah, simply because we should not be streamlining them oh at such a young age to yeah. say that actually you're not clever enough, so you go to the the other class. I don't think that's the right approach. And yeah. yeah, so I'm very thankful for. I know everybody condemns Masli, but that's something very good that Masli has done. You know, I agree because. I went to science stream only because, uh, but I'm really bad at maths, right? But I was told throughout my schooling years for 11 years that I will fail in life because I failed in maths. Yeah, and they'll say, you know, don't go art stream, uh. art stream classes. Oh I'm not good. Yeah. I hated that because I'm not good in science, but I'm there because of peer pressure, because I will feel that I'm a reject if I don't make it, but I have zero interest in it. So there's a minimum run age to run for office, right? Should there also be an age limit? You know, election is about choosing a wakil rakyat. A person who best represent you in that area. Now, if if you are in Kuala Lumpur and the demands are great and you want a younger person who can run around really fast, then that's the right of the voters there. Yeah. But what if you represent a, a retirement village? Mm -hmm. A place where they feel that a young MP in his 20s or 30s will not be able to understand me. So there will be places like that across Malaysia, of you course. can imagine, yeah. where the young have gone away, but the, the, the older ones are there. Yeah. For those, that's also their right to choose their elected representative. So it's, it's up to them, up to voters, who they want. If you feel that a senior elderly man or woman can best represent you, that's their right. Can you name us three issues that are most, that closest to your heart, that are most important to you? And um, will this be the issues that you champion if you get re-elected as an MP. Yeah. First is of course, government delivery system. I feel that Malaysians are so frustrated every time they have to deal with government. From taking a number to getting a passport done, uh, the queue, uh, going to the counters, but out of 10 counters, only three are open. These are just basic things that Malaysians want to be able to know that when I pay tax, you know, at least these basic counter services, I can assess. Uh, you know, and if it's an online service, make it easy. Don't make people get username, password that they cannot remember. And then they have to physically, some of them say, to open an online account, you have to physically go to the place and get your username and your password. If I'm going to drive to that place, I might as well just stay there and get my things done. So improving government delivery system. Yeah. Now, number two, really my concern is about flood. I feel mm. that in Kuala Lumpur now, for those areas that are hit by flood, there is no peace. Every time the sky turns dark, yeah. there is great distress, you know, for KL people. Do yeah. I drive out of the basement now? Do I leave work? Do, how do I run out and, and make sure I'm not caught in, in flood? Because yeah. it's not just about 
uh, water residing, uh, receding, but it's about your damage to your cars. I, I've seen new cars being wiped out just because they went to work in Kuala Lumpur and they yes. didn't know it was raining. If you're inside a shopping mall, you have no clue that it's raining outside yes. and you cannot relocate your car. So that's really about you know livelihood, yeah. flood, very critical. Number three, of course, about children protection. Uh, I'm very passionate about this because I feel that every day there are so many damage being done to children uh, because the system is not there to protect them. If we don't raise against time, you are going to have more and more 18 years old and below violated. And they are going to grow up very quickly to become adult and they will be hurting inside. And, you know, hurting people will hurt others. And, and we want to break that vicious cycle. Yeah. How would your ideal Malaysia look like? Oh, I just want a functioning country. I want LRT not to break down. I want uh, to be able to go out when it's raining and not fear that I will not be able to make it back safely. Yeah. Um, I, I just want speed in, in government agencies, you know. I want kids to go out and feel safe. Uh, we don't have that anymore today. Those days, during my time, nine years old, I could walk back from school alone. Now, a lot of parents, even if it's the, the child is in Form 1 or Form 2, we are worried and we are terrified. Yeah. Your ideal version of Malaysia is one that is just safe, chop chop, safe, functional, functional. Yep. practical. Yep. We don't, we don't, we're not even thinking about all the idealistic yeah, no, fun. For, forget about being number one in, in, yeah. I just want it to be working. Oh my god. Yeah, a working Malaysia. Love that.